Right, all right. Okay, so we all welcome to um, this meetup, the September meetup. Um, it's really nice to have us here. Um, so it's a joint meetup, um, as you might be aware. It's um, Pi Data Hamburg and the NLP, um, Hamburg NLP. So just to um, see, before we get started, we should know that this section is recorded. So if you don't feel comfortable with maybe your face being shown or your name or whatever, you could just mute your mic and turn off your turn off your camera and also maybe um, change your name preferably uh, and it's as uh, just to let us know that um, it's recorded. Um, so first of all, um, if you have questions, you could just raise your hands first. So if you have any question, you just raise your hand. You can use the icon here. So this raise hand feature in Zoom. And then one of the moderators would unmute you. Um, subsequently, I would introduce the other moderators to us and also the organizing committee. Um, so just to walk through the agenda. So basically having, um, so we started 18.30, that's 6.30 PM, that's um, German time, yeah. So um, we'll have our first talk, um, Philip Schmidt, and have a break. Then we have a second talk by Leticia, and then subsequently we're open to um, discussions and networking. So, yeah, so just to um, state briefly so for Pi Data, we have a Pi Data Global um, conference that's coming up October 28th to 30th. And I'm excited for it. I don't know about you, I'm really excited. And yeah, so basically it's. Um, a, a conference that's going to take place online. However, we have the scholarship. Now, there's an impact scholarship that's for um, underrepresented groups. Um, so it's um, open, open to people that are looking to develop their career as well. So I'm going to put details in the chat. Subsequently, you see the, the details in the chat for us to um, register if you're interested for the scholarship. So the conference is online, like I said, and uh, more details I will share in the in the chat. So, yeah. So just to introduce PyData Hamburg to us. So we have PyData Hamburg. PyData is a global community for developers and users of open source data tools for data analysis and uh, machine learning and so so forth. And um, we also, in collaboration with um, Non-Focus, so PyData is an educational program of Non-Focus as well, where Non-Focus is a, a non-profit organization in the US. So just to have more details about us, you could um, check our Twitter, so that's our Twitter, PyData Hamburg, our LinkedIn, and um, also Non-Focus. We have um, our YouTube channel as well, PyData TV. So subsequently, um, we release videos of um, this particular meetup or meetup, subsequent meetups on the on the um, YouTube channel. So we could go there and check and watch and review. And yeah, sometimes I, I also go back sometimes to watch some certain things, some clarifications to get some clarifications, some questions that we ask just to get answers to them. Yes. Yeah, so. Um, so now this is the Pi Data Hamburg team. So um, so the first person, Maria. I don't know if Maria is there. Maybe she could say hello or maybe <laughs> Maria. Um, then myself, Obina, then Alexandros, Alexandros, then Daphne, Daphne as well, then Kaiti and Camila. So this um, we're part of the Pi Data Hamburg organizing committee. And um, so also for the PyData Hamburg, we are calling for participation speakers. We are interested in having speakers. So if um, you're building something interesting with open source data tools and you want to speak about it, we're actually looking forward to welcoming you um, to speak about whatever you're working on or interested. So you could reach out to any of the um, organizing committee members. And also we're looking out for volunteers. So meetup planning, speaker outreach and support. 
yeah, we have hands on deck, but then having more people is not a bad idea, I think. So if you're interested and you want to, so this is actually my first time of organizing something like this. And if you want to have the opportunity to do that, it's, it's a very good um, place to start. So we're looking out for volunteers as well. So I'll hand over to a representative from the um, NLP, Hamburg NLP to continue from here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bastian. Um, I'm an organizer from the group Meet NLP, and um, we are a community um, that tries to build the platform all about uh, natural language processing. And um, we are based in Hamburg, but uh, from the start, uh, we were forced from Corona to, um, yeah, uh, have our meetups um, online and we really appreciate it that we um, were able to have um, speakers and um, yeah, partic participations from all over the world and uh, we really like that. And so also when the Corona situation will change, uh, we will definitely um, keep this this way and uh, we'll try to stream our meetups also um, online so that everyone can join. Um, at the moment, uh, our meetups are roughly every two months. And um, yeah, uh, like I said, uh, we are trying to build a community. So we uh, would like to have not just the meetups, but also um, provide some links to libraries, um, share some code and um, at the moment, uh, we mainly do that. Can you um, go on one slide further? Yep. Okay, interesting. It's, um, well, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, we are um, mostly uh, currently based um, at the community Slack channel. Um, our website is uh, still in progress. Um, and, um, we are also right now um, looking for new members in the organization team. And um, we would yeah, really like if also um, people from different, different ethnic groups or different um, genders uh, would like to participate there because at the moment we are only uh, four white males. And um, we really think this uh, is, yeah, not showing the diversity that we um, would like to um, to have to have in our group, and so um, maybe, uh, of course, also if you are a white male and you really like to join, uh, you are welcome, of course. But um, yeah, everyone else, please, uh, please, um, yeah, like to. <laughs> we really like uh, other people also. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Camilla. <laughs> um, so uh, if you're interested, just contact us. And um, yeah, um, Lucas will also present us a small survey that we um, did. Lucas? Hi, sorry. I think my internet connection is very unstable. So I try to do it without video. So. I'm very happy to, to be here today and yeah, we need your help because we would like to create a European landscape for NLP focused companies. So we heard a lot of very impressive um, um, speakers during the, the last year on NLP focused topics and we would like to create a European landscape on NLP focused companies and to maintain a calendar of NLP events and for this we need your input. So um, please fill in uh, the form and send us the NLP companies and NLP events you know so we will then share it and um, combine it into a European landscape so I currently or I just send um, or filled in a uh, link um, to the form so please help us out help us to enrich this European NLP landscape. Okay. 
And just to be clear, it's natural language processing. It's not new linguistic um, programming. <clears throat> we had that before. Uh, so natural language processing, that's the stuff we like and know about. <clears throat> Okay, um, just to say um, you're host for the evening. So myself, Obina, and um, Bastian. Bastian has stopped as well. Then Lucas, because we just stopped, and Alexandros. So now I would um, hand over to Alexandros um, to continue from here. Uh, Philip speaks first, so... Okay. Oh, okay, 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 okay. So yeah, sorry about that. Okay, so without further ado, I think I can speak for the Meet NLP Hamburg community in uh, saying that, first of all, we're very happy to be part of this event. And second of all, we're also just as happy to introduce Philip Schmidt, our first speaker of the evening. He's an ML engineer and tech lead at a name that is ubiquitous, I think, in NLP research, Hugging Face. And he'll give us an introduction to the new SageMaker integration in Hugging Face. Hi, everyone. Um, I think you need to stop sharing your screen and then I can take over. So. You should be able to see my presentation, right? Yes. And only the presentation. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, thanks again for the invitation. I'm happy to talk to you today. And I will not only give an introduction into the um, new SageMaker integration, uh, integration, I will also talk about the Hugging Face ecosystem, which like dramatically grew over the last couple of months. But before we get started, so to me, I'm, I'm Philip. I'm from Germany in Nuremberg. I am a machine learning engineer and tech lead at Hugging Face. And if you have any questions, ideas, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter, LinkedIn, via email, or we have like a big uh, forum at Hugging Face on the discuss.huggingface.co. So open the thread and tag me there. Happy to help you answer questions or like just chat with you. And for the agenda today, and first, I will talk about Hugging Face as a company, how we work and how we live. Then the second part will be about the Hugging Face ecosystem, how we basically created like an open source, open science system used by probably anyone at NLP right now. And then at the end, we will do a yeah, short little hands-on session, how you can use the new SageMaker int integration. But before we begin, I start with a little guessing game, which is probably obvious to the most of you. The question here is, um, what uh, is the common link between the Tesla autopilot, the Google um, mail auto completion, the Facebook translation service uh, feature and the Bing search results? I guess the answer might be quite obvious. It's like, of course, the transformer model and through the transformer model, Tesla is able to um, yeah, understand the vector space with their cameras, Gmail is able to predict how you want to finish your sentence. Facebook is able to automatically translate your post into over 150 different languages and asking Bing a question in natural language and it understands um, and retrieves the information relevant for your search. But another piece between the four transformers use case we see, which is less common is that each of those handle like billions of prediction each day. And if you are not Google, Facebook, Microsoft, or Tesla, these are like rare cases where companies are able to train and deploy transformer models. And that's why our mission at Hugging Face is to democratize NLP and transformers, or rather now saying it was to democratize NLP. And we now want to basically yeah, democratize machine learning in general, because Hugging Face, uh, not Hugging Face transformers are literally eating the world of machine learning. We introduced this year several um, architectures for speech and visions and the traction of it is like amazing. We have already over 400 different speech models and over 100 different vision models for image classification, automatic speech recognition. So transformers are not only limited to NLP now, and that's why we want to 
give everyone in the world access of machine learning to it. And you are probably asking yourself, okay, how can a small startup of 50 to 70 people achieve something what Google and Microsoft are doing basically every day? And the answer is pretty easy. One part of it is our awesome growing community. The Transformers Library, for example, has currently close to 1,000 individual active contributors. And on the right side, you can see the GitHub stars growing over time within red, the Transformers Library next to other amazing open source projects like MongoDB or Spark. And you can see basically Transformers is skyrocketing since the release of it. And in addition to it, we have a, a, yeah, a public model hub basically with over 15 thousand available community created models in over 200 different languages. The second part of yeah, how we can achieve this is our open source ecosystem. We have created several open source projects which increase and makes it easy for companies and individuals to use transformer based models, but we are going to be de yeah, more into depth about the, all of them later. Um, another part I definitely want to highlight is we have um, created a new course. Earlier this year, we launched the first part of it. The second part will come at the end of November. This course will teach you anything you need to know about NLP and Transformers using all our open source libraries from Transformers, data sets, tokenizer, and Accelerate. And the best part about the course, it's basically free. So you can go to huggingface.co slash course and immediately start. And every like execution and training will be used using a Google Colab. And another awesome part about this is that the course comes in like two variants. So if you are a PyTorch user, you can do the course in PyTorch. And if you are a TensorFlow user, you can use TensorFlow to go through the code, uh, the course. And so far we talked about the open source and the community, but there are over 5,000 different companies using Transformers already in production. And here you can see a few examples of how companies are using Transformers today. For example, we have Monzo, um, which uses text classification to accelerate their custom support or check, which uses Transformers to extract and retrieve information. We already mentioned being early on the first slide to understand your search queries and like your answers your question. And these are the use cases, but how are you able to implement or bring this into your company and projects? And that's pretty easy. That's where the Hugging Face ecosystem comes in. And as I already said, the Hugging Face ecosystem grew dramatically over the last couple of months. And it's like almost hard to fit basically any service and library into one slide. So either we need to stop or to create bigger slides. And um, the Hugging Face model or the Hugging Face ecosystem was in the beginning just the Transformers library, or maybe a few of you know that Transformers, before it was named Transformers, was called PyTorch, BERT, and then PyTorch Transformers. So we started with BERT implementation, then we added a few several and other architectures, and now we have like over 70 different Transformers architecture, and the whole ecosystem grew from just training a few models to a complete end-to-end -end machine learning platform with open source and open science as building blocks. And the heart of it is our Hugging Face Hub. And the Hugging Face Hub consists out of two pillars, the Model Hub and the Dataset Hub. The Model Hub is a central repository for state-of-the-art models across different frameworks. The Hub, as already mentioned, hosts over 15,000 public models from the Transformers library, but not also for, uh, only from the Transformers library, also have now integrations into an other NLP libraries like NLNP or maybe for the German viewer player. And we also have integrations from vision libraries like Tim and speech libraries like SpeechBrain and ESPNet. So you can find uh, not only NLP models on huggingface.co. And the newest addition, which we are very proud of, is like we added integration and support for fast AI models and scikit-learn models. Each model consists out of a model card, a file repository managed by Git, so you have version control by default and a setting page. Here you can see like two examples. The left one is a scikit-learn model um, card repository for um, yeah, doing the wine quality challenge on Kaggle. And on the right side, you can see um, a vision transformers for object detection using our new object detection widget, which we released yesterday. And basically any or almost any of these 15,000 models provide the model card 
and the inference, which should be model cards, mostly post information about how the model was trained, how you can use it, which limitations it has, and also the inference widget where you can like basically seamless test the model inside a browser without the need to run any Python code or any yeah, start any virtual machine container to just test a few models. So it's super nice. Feel free to go to huggingface.co slash models afterwards, search for models in your language in the task you want to do and then just try it out. In addition to like the visual and the UI we have for the hub, the hub also offers or has its own SDK, which can be used to programmatically interact with the hub to make integrations into existing machine learning, machine learning ecosystems or into your own pipelines. The code step that you can see here, we are basically creating a new class, extending the PyTorch model and the model hub mixin. The model hub mixin is coming from the SDK, which enables basically the class to be saved and pushed to the model hub and to be loaded from the model hub. So with this like small little code snippet, you can make any PyTorch model compatible with the Hugging Face Hub and have an automatic version controlled cloud storage for all of your machine learning models. And you can train on machine A and load it on machine B without like having to do any heavy lifting or migrating something. The second pillar of the hub is the data set hub which offers now over 1,200 public available data sets for NLP, speech, vision, tabular data, and many more areas. You can also use the Hugging Face Hub to, uh, the data set hub to host your own data sets public, or if you have like in a company context privately, and you can basically upload your CSV file to it, use the data sets library, and load your CSV file from there and have a, like an object you can use for training with the transformers library. And you don't need to write any like loading script. It's everything handled by the data set library. The next we are going to take a look at the open source libraries from the ecosystem. Tokenizer and transformers are the building blocks right now for modern NLP. With tokenizers, you can convert your normal human readable text into tokens and then into IDs. The IDs then can be used with transformers to train a model or to run inference. And as mentioned earlier, we started with one bird model and now we have 74 different state-of-the-art transformer architectures for vision, NLP and speech. And we are growing super fast and hopefully we can like achieve the 100 different architectures as soon as possible. So if you have any ideas or if you read any like research paper and think, okay, this would be a good for fit for the for a new architectures and transformers, feel free to open a GitHub issue on transformers with like a model request. And if it's interesting, we can integrate it into the transformers library. Also very interesting and helpful for yeah, using transformers libraries, the transformers library is that we are providing a trainer API to easily fine-tune a pre-trained model on a given task and data set. And the nice part about it is basically this trainer abstract all of the heavy lifting for writing training loops, evaluation loops, and managing the underlying infrastructure. The trainer supports setups for CPU, GPU, multi-GPU, and also multi-node, multi-GPU, and TPU. So it's like super easy for you to run like your training or give it a test run on your local machine on your cpu and then go to a big gpu cluster and run exactly the same training script pro providing your hyperparameter as training arguments and at the end of the evaluation you can push it to the app and then use it for inference our newest released open source library are accelerate and optimum Accelerate is a fully PyTorch based approach to training. It's basically the opposite of trainer. It's not abstracting anything. Accelerate lets you handle your own training loop. But what it is, what it abstracts, it's like the heavy lifting of all the infrastructure. So the code snippet you can see on the left with the diffs um, let, can be run on CPU, GPU, multi GPU, and multi node, multi GPU, and also TPU. So you are also writing your own custom training loop adding a few accelerate properties like the device and preparing the model and optimize and data for it. And accelerate will find out under the hood, okay, is he running on a CPU machine? Is he running on a GPU or on a TPU? So you can basically use the same training script for the 
um, infrastructure you want to use. And then Optimum, which has been released last week, is our new open source toolkit for transformers production performance. We are going to enable maximum efficiency for training and running model on specific um, hardware. In the example, you can see um, how you can like quantize a transformers model with Optimum and Intel's low precision optimization tool for the Intel uh, Xeon C CPUs. With that, you can like use the pre-trained models, fine tune it, and even like optimize it for your dedicated hardware to run on. The next yeah, part of the ecosystems are our main managed training solution. And there we have the auto NLP service, which is, which is like 100% auto ML library for NLP, but you can also now do speech and vision tasks since transformers are able to do it. With auto NLP, you can train state of the art transformers model without any experience or knowledge. You just need to provide a data set and auto NLP will handle the rest behind the scenes. It selects the best model architecture for your task. It makes sure that evaluation is correct. It uploads it to the hub and then can be used for inference. So it's really like the three lines of code you can see on the snippets. It's creating a project, uploading your data, executing train, and then you are ready to reuse it for inference. And then on the other side, we have SageMaker in a particular SageMaker training, which um, also obstructs the heavy lifting for the infrastructure you need for deep learning, but you can focus on how you want to train your model. So with SageMaker, you are providing the training script and SageMaker will take care of the managing the underlying infrastructure. So it will start the EC2 instance you want to use for training. It will stop the EC2 instance after training. It will upload your model to S3. It provides logs and CloudWatch. It has an integrated profiler to make sure that you are not running into any bottlenecks. You have a debugger where you can basically hook into your training and make sure, okay, you don't have any performance degradation. And of course, after you have trained your model using either the open source or auto NLP or SageMaker, you are most likely to want to test your model before going into production. That's where spaces can shine in. Spaces is a, yeah, a simple way to host machine learning demos directly on Hugging Face CO. And currently we support two SDKs to let you build cool machine learning apps with Python. One of it is Streamlit and the other one is Cradio. So you can basically create your space using Streamlit and Cradio. Hugging Face will make sure it hold, uh, that it will be hosted correctly. It will be exposed to the public and then can be used. And Spaces is currently in beta, but will be available soon for all of you. And if you're already interested in Spaces, you can go to huggingface.co slash Spaces. We have, I think, around over 150 different Spaces to test out NLP use cases, speech use cases, and also vision. And the last part of it, after you make sure you have like an optimized trained model, you tested it in your space and are fine with it, you want to yeah, put it into production. And that's where our inference solution are needed. Currently, we offer three different kinds of inference solution. The first is the inference API, which also powers our hub and the 15,000 models on the hub. So if your model is available on the Hugging Face Hub, it's also automatically deployed to the inference API. So if you are uploading a model to the hub, which is compatible with the libraries I mentioned earlier or with transformers, the inference API will pick it up, deploy it, and it's ready for you to use. So basically all of the knowledge and the doing for deploying a model will be abstracted and handled by us. With SageMaker on the other side, you can also host these models, but inside your own controlled environment. So if your company has some compliant, compliance guidelines, you can easily manage them with using SageMaker for hugging phase. In addition to this, SageMaker allows you to extend your inference code. So if you want to have a custom pre-processing or post-processing, you can define this with using SageMaker. And our yeah, most exciting new inference service, which isn't released yet, but if you followed our social media, you notice that we are going to have a live event next Tuesday, September 28th, where we are announcing Hugging Face Infinity. So if you haven't signed up, you definitely should. And keep an eye on our social media to learn more about Infinity. And Infinity will be our own containerized solution to deploy fully optimized inference pipelines for state-of-the-art transformer models into your own production environment. 
And the most exciting thing about us, we achieve down to one millisecond inference latency for bird-like models on GPU and four to 10 milliseconds on CPU-like models. Okay, before we jump into the hands-on session, are there any questions we could answer? Yes, I think there, there is a question from Less Guessing. Um, do you need to tell Auto NLP which algorithm to use or will it pick the best one? Because the tabular data on AWS does uh, regression classification and what are the algorithm choices for NLP on Hugging Face? So in Auto NLP, you don't need to define um, the algorithm behind it. Basically what you are doing, I can go back to the slides, is you are, you are telling auto NLP which task you want to do. So in NLP vision or speech, we have like different tasks you want to fine tune on. Example of a task in NLP is text classification or question answering. For speech, it would be automatic speech recognition and vision, for example, object detection or image classification. So you can create your auto NLP project with your dedicated task, for example, text classification, upload your data set, where you need like a specific format for text classification would be you need to have like one column with your text and another column with your label you want to like train on. And then auto NLP will like, train multiple models behind the scene, pick the best architecture, optimize the hyperparameters and provide you not only the best model, also the other models if you are curious to look into what auto NLP has done. Oh, thanks. Along those lines, so is there a menu of algorithms or tasks, as you call them, to choose from, or, or it does it automatically select? So, so I'll see a, a menu of tasks that I can pick, and that's all, and then I just upload my data? My yeah, data. yeah, like um, as of speaking right now, we launched a new landing page, I think, two hours ago. So if you go to huggingface.co slash autoNLP, you can see our new UI, which has like screenshots of how you can create a project how it, it's going to look like selecting your task, providing the data and then running your model with having like multiple like runs with the performance and how far they are. Wow, that's fantastic. And then ultimately it outputs to uh, an HTTPS endpoint. Is that what it is, an inference endpoint? You, and, 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 and now you got to build your own front end, right? Or is that connected to Createo or something like that? No, so basically auto NLP is using the hub uh, the Hugging Face Hub as backend. So all of the auto NLP trained models will be uploaded to the Hugging Face Hub. And since the hub is again connected to the inference API, all of your models trained will be available for inference. And you can use the like dedicated HTTPS endpoint wherever you want using like in REST client, like Insomnia or creating your own web app using React and then integrating it. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I have two other questions here. One from Sham Saden. I hope I pronounced it right. What will you recommend to start learning having face and he prefers books? So I would definitely recommend our new course. It will like start with how or what is transformers, what are encoder, decoder models, what are like sequence to sequence models. Then the second part will go into detail how you can fine tune your own transformer model using a pre-trained model like BERT. So that's definitely a good starting point for it. Each um, section of the course has a video to go through and code example and also additional like ex exercises. And those are accessible from the Hugging Face website, right? Yeah, it's huggingface.co slash course. Lovely. And another question is uh, from Jay Wing Chan. Do you also need to define language of your data set for uh, auto NLP? Um, there are multiple options. So when creating an auto NLP project, you can select the task, uh, the, sorry, the language of your data set. So if you have like a data set in German, you can select German and English, it's English, but you also can train multilingual models. So you could have like a data set containing German and English data points. And uh, next one we have from Ar Arkari Barada. Yusuf, uh, why, uh, and he's asking why Auto NLP can't use or be used in the SageMaker. So Auto NLP is basically 
not just the script which is being executed. Auto NLP is like a whole solution and service which requires just more than running on a VM. We have a like a database, for example, to managing all of the experiments. So it's like not that easy to run on SageMaker, but um, it is used behind the scenes. So Auto NLP also uses SageMaker to run the, all of your training. Um, I don't so auto that. NLP is it in the cloud or what? Yes. Can, can't we run it uh, on local machine? For now. I think the question is: is if, if it can run on premise or it can be only done via cloud uh, REST service. Yes, yeah, so, so Auto NLP is basically a SaaS service hosted and managed by us. But if you are interested in like hosting it inside your own company environment, feel free to reach out to us. Um, we can hop on a call and like discuss how we can make this work. Any other question? If not, we can jump into this session and answer the questions later. Mm. Right. I, I don't see any questions more at the okay. moment. Okay. Then next part of this is the, the yeah, showing you how easy it is to use the SageMaker integration with a uh, hugging face. So, you hopefully can see in my browser where I'm on the huggingface.co website. And what we have built with SageMaker and the Amazon team is basically a seamless integration from the Hugging Face Hub to SageMaker. And you can, when you go to a model, and for example, here you can see all of the models and select um, a bird model. You have like these quick action tabs basically. And um, bird base is a pre-trained model, so it's not fine-tuned for any specific task. So we can use it to run training on um, any task we probably want. And when you click on train, you can select um, Amazon SageMaker, you will get a pop-up pop selecting your task. So if I want to fine-tune or train my bird base model on text classification, I can select my task. And also then I need to select, okay, where I'm going to start my training. So if I'm running inside SageMaker on a SageMaker notebook instance or SageMaker Studio, I can select AWS S config. And if I want to start my training from your local machine, I can select local machine. And then we are creating a code snippet, which you can copy to either your local machine or to SageMaker, which will take care of, um, well, basically provides boilerplate code for your training. And the only thing you need to do is to extend the hyperparameter on how many epochs you want to train, which data set you want to use. So, but like since training takes more than just a few minutes, we are not training a model, we are more deploying a model. So for deploying a model, we want to select a model which is already pre-trained. Therefore we can use the filters on the right, left side and say, okay, we want to have a model fine-tuned for question answering, select our preferred model. In this case, we go with the deep set Roberta base squad two select and deploy the Amazon SageMaker, or, and again, select our configuration. Since I already started the SageMaker notebook instance, I can go with AWS, copy to clipboard, jump into my notebook where I just um, basically upgraded the SageMaker SDK, paste it, and then, yeah, SageMaker SDK will deploy our model to the SageMaker instance, if my kernel would run. Okay, it runs, perfect. So this will like take a few minutes. Um, until this, I can show you what's happening behind the scenes. So we are now in the AWS management console at the SageMaker service. Okay, one second. And when going to SageMaker, you have like multiple different areas. So since SageMaker isn't only a service for training and inference, it provides a lot of more functionalities as ground rule for labeling data notebook, which I already mentioned is where you can run and create hosted and managed Jupyter notebook instances pro processing, which is basically the service before training and inference when you want to like pre-process thousands of data points and then multiple more 
And since we created our inference service, what SageMaker will do, it will create a model containing the information we provided. So the deep set for Berta large squad two fine tuned model and our task, which was question answering. Then we are creating some endpoint configuration, which contains information about, okay, um, which model we want to deploy, which instance we are going to use. In this case, we select the DM5X large instance, which is a CPU instance, and how many instances we want to launch on. So if we want to scale up the model, we can easily adjust the configuration and go with, instead of one initial instance count, we can go to two. Also, if you want to have like auto scaling, which is SageMaker um, or SageMaker can do, you can go into, define uh, metrics on how you want to scale your model. So if the CPU usage is above 70%, you can say, okay, now scale up to another instance. And this all is, is going to be managed by these endpoint configurations. And out of an endpoint configuration, we have our endpoint, which will be available as HTTP um, API to be used with the REST client, the front end, or with um, yeah, SDKs provided by Amazon. Oh, great. Wait. Wow, that was fast. So as you can see, we have, um, maybe to go through the code again, we have our configuration for our model with Roberta Base Squad 2. We have our task. We have the hugging face model, which we have seen in the console. And then we have the deploy method, which deploys the hugging face model to SageMaker with our configuration for our instance time and our the number of instance. And this deploy method returns a predictor, which we then can use to, to run inference. So if I copy this down and change the question to uh, the meetup is run in or is called by data and change the question who runs the meetup. You can see it returns our like predicted answer with pi data. And that's how you can deploy basically any of the transformer compatible models from the hub to SageMaker to use for inference. And if you are done testing, you can use the predictor again and execute the delete endpoint method and everything will be cleaned up and you are not like wasting tons of money for having endpoints running without using them. Okay, that's it. Any more questions? Yeah, I'm curious, anytime I, I deal with AWS and I'm curious about the same thing for, for hugging faces, how do I know how much this is gonna cost me and that suddenly I won't get a bill and I'll be broke? So for, for SageMaker, it's pretty easy. Um, SageMaker, when you go, go search for Google on Amazon SageMaker pricing, you have like um, dedicated tabs for each of the different services. So for inference, you can see the instant uh, the price per hour per instance type. So in our case, we have DM5 instance, which costs around, I think, 50 to 70 cents per hour. And then you can like multiply by the number of hours you run. So a normal month has around 750 hours with the 50 cents, you should be around something like, yeah, 300, $200 or something. And that's how you can calculate. And also AWS has a new pricing calculator. So you should definitely check this out, which makes calculating all of the prices for your services way easier. Great, thank you. Are there more questions, maybe? Okay, then okay. again, we can switch to the second talk. Yeah, thanks for, for all of your questions. And as I said, if you have any questions after the meetup or tomorrow or the next week, feel free to contact me wherever you want or open an issue on our GitHub repositories or on the forum. We are happy to have you. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, does the uh, hugging face hire uh, actually? 
Yes. We and do. Uh, so, do you hire uh, only remote position or because I don't know the headquarters where are they in Argentina? So yes, we hire, and you can go to angel.co and search for hiring space. We have like many different positions open, full-time remote or also on-site. And currently we have offices in Paris and in New York. Oh. Okay, thank you very much. So thanks, Philip. Uh, I think we are all stunned by what Hugging Face can do. So that's probably the reason why there are no more questions. And um, yeah, so please reach out to, to Philip or to our organization team from uh, Hamburg Natural Language Processing and we will try to find some more answers for you. Oh. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Philip. So I guess now we'll would go on um, a short break. Um, let's say about 13 minutes break. So we'll be back at um, 20 o'clock, 8 o'clock in German time. That was great, Philip. Thank you very much. So it's a great pleasure to have Leticia Pardalabescu with us today. And um, she's gonna share uh, some really nice insight about uh, the transformer architecture. So Leticia studied physics and computer science and she's currently a PhD candidate at Heidelberg University. Her research is focusing on uh, multimodal machine learning that is uh, the integration of vision and language. And also she has a, a YouTube channel called AI Coffee Break with Leticia. And uh, you should definitely check it out because it's very didactic and uh, entertaining as well. So definitely check it out. So without further ado, please, the floor is yours, Leticia, you can start. Thanks, Alex, for the kind introduction and thanks for inviting me to speak to you here. And I'm so happy that Philip <laughs> advertised how easily you can use transformers with Hugging Face because my whole talk will be about transformers <laughs> and uh, it will be about how you can use transformers on more than just text. So I will explain to you what multimodal transformers are, and I will explain a subset of multimodal transformers. So those transformers that are looking at images and text only. And then I, I mean, the first two parts will be of course about their success, but I will also have a last part where I will show some own work about um, uncovering the limitations of these uh, vision and language transformers. But before I can explain you what multimodal transformers are, I think I first have to, you know, spend two words on explaining multimodality. I also have to explain to you uh, just in two words what a transformer is, and yeah, then we can talk about multimodal transformers. So multimodality in machine learning is when we have a system that handles multiple modalities. I know that's not the most informative definition you have heard, so I will uh, just give an example. So if I have a piece of information, like for example, a mountain. I can convey you that piece of information by showing you, for example, an image that is depicting that mountain. I can also have a piece of text that speaks about, you know, that mountain. I can also verbally uh, speak about that mountain. So this information will come to you as for in form of uh, sound waves. And these are examples of modalities that are, you know, very human-like. They are very aligned to our human sensors to um yeah <laughs> but uh, there are also more alien like modalities especially if we focus on machine learning that is not so much about human computer interaction but is uh, machine learning that is for example aiding some other sciences like physics and biology we can uh, also look like uh, data that is, for example, just temperature, absolute temperature, which we humans cannot um, perceive, we can perceive only relative temperature, it can be something like pressure, or an extension of, you know, the electromagnetic spectrum, we call visible light, and we have our pictures in a very tiny 
fraction of what is actually going out there in the universe. So we could have, you know, a machine learning system looking at X-ray, as gamma rays, at microwave or radio, you know, and we can even go crazier for example, gravitational waves. But for this talk, I will just focus on, you know, the more human-like modalities um, and uh, yeah, focus on how the transformers handle those. And why a machine learning system endowed with, uh, you know, multimodal <laughs> powers is uh, more advantageous than, you know, a machine learning model focusing only on one modality uh, is, for example, very nicely described in this ACL 2020 paper by Bender and Koller. And uh, you can read the paper on your own. It's really uh, it's a nice paper. We have also covered it on our channel, of course. Uh, but in a nutshell, uh, if um, to, to just say why a multimodal system is better than a unimodal one, if we, for example, want to achieve natural language understanding, uh, this paper tells us that uh, language enough, so text alone, is, for example, not enough to achieve natural language understanding. So um, just uh, to think about it, if we have a machine learning system that has seen a hammer, that has felt a hammer, that has a that has uh, you know hit a nail with a hammer that system ad understands better what uh, the idea of a hammer is than for example a system that has just read about hammers on the internet and extracted some statistical correlations that tell it for example that hammers are appearing in the same context context often with nails uh, and another argument is made by this paper, Experience Grounds Language by Jonathan Biskin, collaborator, uh, that uh, you know makes a roadmap to what we really want to uh, do, uh, or what we, uh, the authors, think we should do if we want to get to natural language understanding. So if we want to move away from text only. So the first two steps of this roadmap are where we are right now now so uh, we have large corpora of text or you know the text that has been written on the internet and we have language models that are really uh, well capturing and parroting back what um, you know they have read uh, but to have a model that really you know understands things or starts to understand things we need perception. So that model needs to have more sensory uh, inputs, for example, vision and hear, um, be able to hear and so on. Um, and uh, that is, you know, multimodality. That is my what I am very interested in. But of course, the, <laughs> the story perhaps starts for me there, but it doesn't end there if we want to go to NLU, natural language understanding, because we also need something like embodiment. So um, while in the third step, the um, system is passively you know, listening or watching everything we feed it with. In the embodiment case where the system has a body, it can also trigger its own training instances by interacting with the world. And then of course the apex is the social world where the system can interact socially with other agents or with us. And uh, yeah, but I will focus on step three and uh, I will tell you right now what it has to do with transformers because when I started my PhD a few years ago, the field looked entirely differently from now. So now we have this transformer architecture that does everything. But before, if we had, for example, two modalities like image and text, we had the CNN that was processing the image. We had the LSTM that was processing the textual modality. And uh, the problem was the following. While uh, CNNs and LSTMs are quite good at processing their own modalities, it's problematic when we want to integrate what they give us because the CNN, in a sense, summarizes the whole image into a vector and the LSTM does the same thing, cramping everything into a single vector. And then we have two vectors, each coming from a different modality and we want to integrate those things. And um, well, this is problematic because uh, never um, at the beginning, so the first layer of the CNN cannot interact with the other modality with the first cell of the LSTM or something. So uh, until the bitter end, so the system in the end has to work with just this summary representation. And uh, this is not okay. And uh, the problem is exactly because we need very different architectures for 
very different kinds of data. What, uh, CNN is uh, you know, uh, focused on grid-like structure and LSTM is for sequences, um, especially, I mean, 2D convolutions I'm speaking of. So uh, the transformer is the exact opposite of it. <laughs> the transformer does not discriminate between mo uh, modalities anymore. So as long as your modality is represented as a vector, the transformer can work with it because transformers do not work with grids, do not work with sequences, they work with sets. And sets are unordered and uh, whatever structure is between these vectors, like for example, a sequence, we have then to really weirdly sometimes uh, put back into the transformer. So here I have a very simplified view of uh, a transformer block as presented in uh, the original attention is all you need paper. And uh, here your text, your sequence is represented as vectors, but you see these vectors are, you know, um, if you exchange them, if you just permute all these vectors or, or the words, the transformer wouldn't notice in this uh, case that something happened. So uh, the result in the end would be the same because every computation here is in parallel. And if you really want to you know, <laughs> make it obvious that there is a sequence here, that there is some order in that set of vectors, which is now our text, we have to introduce these strange things, these positional embeddings, which are kind of identifiers that are telling, um, that are added to the vector representations that are telling the system, look, this is the first word, this is the second word, and so on. And because of these positional embeddings, if we, so if we ch exchange the uh, word vectors themselves, uh, the positional, um, embeddings do not rotate too, because you know the first positional embedding is just for the first position. So this is how we you know, put back into the transformer the, the sequence, uh, sequential nature of text. So uh, the, the, no, the question now with uh, modalities and multiple modalities is how do you represent that as a vector? And how do you, um, encode that structure or order if there is some back into the transformer. For example, with text, you use these positional embeddings. And, uh, you know, the question of, of how to represent everything as a vector is uh, not that simple as represented here, but uh, in text, you could uh, just, you know, assign a unique vector for each word in the English vocabulary or whatever language you're, you're working with. It, tokenization is a little more complicated, but this is, you know, a very simplified view. And uh, the question is how then to represent images as vectors because to be able uh, to process them with a transformer. And here the answer is uh, easier than expected because uh, images are in a sense vectors already. In fact, there are matrices um, in, in a grayscale image, for example. And um, if you just uh, take each row of that matrix and write it one after the other, you already have a sequence and you have represented your image as a sequence. And uh, yeah, this would could look strangely like, <laughs> why would you do that? But uh, this is how cathode ray tube uh, monitors and uh, you know all TVs were actually drawing the image back in the day. Now it's a little different, but that's how it was. And um, then the question is, but then how does the transformer know that this is, you know, the upper part of the, um, of the image or the lower part? Well, positional embeddings, <laughs> this is the answer. And uh, yeah, sometimes, I mean, uh, vectorization of images is a little different or a little more complicated uh, because if you do it like I just did, <laughs> then you uh, really blow up your sequence length because you can imagine a high resolution pixel has um, image has a lot of pixels, so a lot of rows and uh, this then could get you into trouble. But um, I mean, if you if as long as you can imagine a vector is a uh, way to vectorize a, a modality, then you're fine and you can throw it into a transformer. So um, the text transformer is uh, something I, I think you're familiar with. So um, the thing is that we have our input vectors and the self-attention layer lets uh, every vector be informed on every other vector in the sequence. And uh, then the uh, feed forward, uh, feed forward neural network produces an output. Uh, so the thing is with transformers is that as many vectors as you have as input, as many vectors then you have as output in the encoder. So um, 
yeah, but the, the thing is that <laughs> these vectors that are coming out of it are better informed on if the, co the whole context because, you know, the self-attention lets every vector communicate with every other vector. And then on these output vectors, you can do something like uh, uh, a classification or something. And then the question is, okay, I mean, this is how it was introduced for text, but how to do it for images? <laughs> well, a, a simple solution, uh, which in practice has this problem of uh, a big sequence length, but you could just take the image vector, uh, the um, text vectors, and then append the image vectors to those and uh, assign some positional embeddings that sometimes are, I mean, they should be modality specific because images are ordered a little differently than than text, but then you have a, you know, a simple <laughs> text image transformer. And if you th then can imagine a vector format for any other modality you're thinking about, you can have, you know, cramp every modality into a trans uh, transformer and let it do things with it. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it is sometimes a little specific on what the modalities are, but you know, the basic principle of thinking about it is, is this, you know, how to vectorize it and then how to throw it into a transformer. And just to give you some examples of how this uh, and what, you know, transformers have done on different modalities, here is, for example, video bird, where you can process a video with a transformer. And of course, the question is how to cramp a video into <laughs> vectors. <laughs> that's, uh, you know, that's the interesting part of that paper. The rest of the paper is just a transformer. Then we have image uh, image text transformers, uh, and they, for example, this one has been trained on 12 tasks in at the same time, and it can do 12 things at the same time, which is, you know, crazy, but uh, this is what it can do. Then, uh, so the latest papers that are coming out, for example, Perceiver IEO are very clear about the fact that, look, you can use this transformer for anything you want, especially this Perceiver IO is, um, handling uh, the problem of uh, linearly quadrat uh, of uh, quadratically scaling attention so they here really advertise you know just bring your modality we can handle it with it and uh, there are also some more you know alien like modalities like for example sequences of amino acids that are also processed by transformers uh, to uh, to predict protein structure or you know you can take music and produce dance moves <laughs> and these are just some examples of what you can do with transformers and i hope i convinced you with these examples that you can use transformers for everything nowadays and um, yeah and, and then my question is uh, what I'm focusing on during my PhD is, uh, yeah, what about image and text? So uh, here I will focus on uh, uh, vision and language models, uh, basically on vision and language transformers. And uh, so far I advertised, oh, well, it's a transformer as long as it's a vector problem solved. Well, the thing is, it's not that easy because things start to get modality specific. So uh, even though vision and language uh, can be represented the same, uh, because you know they're vectors in the end, <laughs> vision and language are not born equal in a sense. So vision is an evolutionary necessity. It evolved independently in multiple organisms. And uh, language, as far as the, our sophisticated version goes, it's uh, the human stroke of genius. And um, they're, they're quite unequal in their information content. So if we look at language, uh, and if I say things, I often do not you know, say obvious things, like I don't repeat every day that the sky is blue, because that's common knowledge and everybody knows that. <laughs> and uh, if I also say something like the cat is furry, uh, I can you know, I cannot change many things in order to preserve the same meaning or approximately the same meaning. So I can exchange cat with some synonyms, but there are not so many synonyms that you can think of uh, to place there instead of cat. But on the other side, on the visual side, uh, cat uh, can look so differently, right? And uh, here are just some examples of different cats, but imagine the same cat. I mean, even the same cat is problematic because uh, the same cat can be captured by different cameras with different resolutions, different quality, different lighting conditions from different angles. 
And uh, yeah, you create the combinatorial problems there because you know uh, you have many kinds of uh, the same thing. But um, you know, vision might look strange because of that. I mean, a very hard and very um, so combinatorial uh, blow up. But the problem is actually that the. Um, uh, the problem is more the, the language side because the language side is then not easier because you have less combinatorial option to replace words over there, but it's actually even worse because uh, if I have, if I say this cat is furry, uh, you have to infer a lot of information that is not really there. So on the visual side, you see how the cat looks like, you see an angle at least of the cat, but on the, the textual side, you really have to know which cat I mean, right? So it can be a lot that stands behind just uh, these symbols. So there is uh, this problem of inequality between uh, these two modalities and this makes integrating vision and language even with transformers hard. Uh, Leticia, sorry to interrupt you, since you said you prefer also to take questions yeah. in your talk, yeah. there is one uh, asked from, uh, I hope I pronounced it correctly, Nath Namrata. So can mm -hmm. a masked model be used in multimodal transformer and how does it ensure the predicted values will lie in the same feature space modality as input? Yeah, uh, and I have a slide for later for that. <laughs> so I, I'm happy to, to just introduce the answer to your question in, in the talk. And if I don't address it correctly, then please um, just ask again. Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, but really great question. And uh, yeah, I think it's almost the next slide. Yeah, <laughs> okay. So uh, multimodal, uh, so here is a vision and language transformer, a very, you know, um, naive one. It's the, the one where we just have the vectors that are corresponding to the text and we just append the vectors that are corresponding to the image and we throw everything into a transformer. But uh, now the question is how do we really do it? I mean it's um, com uh, in principle nothing stands against doing it this way but in practice um, in this architecture that I'm just presenting here every a uh, token on the language side communicates with every token on the on the image side and of course every token on the image communicates with every other tokens on on every uh, so on the image side so there's a lot of communication there and um, the problem is if we don't know um, so uh, this, the transformer, especially at the beginning during training, and if it has little data, it won't necessarily know which of all these connections that are possible, right, in the, for the self-attention of for computing those scores is are okay and which are not. So we would like to have something of an inductive bias uh, to limit the search space of which, uh, you know, who is connected to whom. And uh, therefore, I present to you now uh, VI Albert, Wilbert, it's, it's a vision and language architecture, how, for example, uh, they do it. We have the text, we represent it as a vector, uh, no in mystery there. We have a transformer module and it, just like BERT and it's getting this as input processing it with self-attention, getting as many vectors as you have as input as output, but the vectors are, you know, better ones, informed uh, ones. And, um, we take the image and if we would take now every row of the image, we would have many, many rows. Our sequence length would be increased and that's sometimes problematic if we have a, not a linearly scaling transformer, but one of the, those others. And uh, this the solution the authors of Wilbert took is to just take um, the image and transform it into patches. And then you have um, some means, like for example, a pre-trained fast RCNN, but not necessarily, to convert every image patch into vectors. And then you have these so-called co-attention transformer modules, which are you know, the usual transformer modules, but the attention layer is of the visual side is allowed to communicate with the um, textual side and vice versa. So in this layer, there is exchange, there's cross-modality happening, uh, parts from one are informed to, uh, about the other. But then, because we want to limit, you know, the communication a little bit, because uh, now there is a, you know, the opportunity for each modality to stay uh, with itself and communicate with itself uh, here. And we can, you know, stack as many layers as we can fit into um, our GPU. And, um, 
and we have a uh, vision and language transformers as there are really some out there and but now we have to do something with it. I mean, we have to train these weights. And here is, I think, where the mask language modeling and uh, comes in because we want to get so to do some pre-training. Like you know, Bert is also pre-trained on news and uh, Wikipedia data, and we want to achieve some um, universal image text representations or generic visual uh, vision and language representations. These. Uh, you know, are the advertisement words, but uh, the question is how generic are the representation anyway, but uh, to to have some a transformer that a pre trained one that has some general idea about, you know, vision and language and them together. So we need some pre training tasks and one pre training task is multimodal mask like language modeling, which is exactly like uh, mask language modeling. Uh, but better, I mean, uh, easier in a sense. So what we can do is, uh, you know, for example, mask out the word mountain over here. So that is a mask. And the model then has to predict that mask. But in, in the language only setting, if you say that is a, that could be anything. That is a cat, that is a dog, that is anything. But now, because we have also the image, right? So the, the transformers are also looking at the image. The search space is constrained because of, because we see a mountain in the image. So um, that mask token, the mountain now has to be predicted uh, mountain and, and there is no much, you know, uh, um, freedom there. And, um, uh, the, the question is how can uh, the model ensure that it's in the uh, that the predicted values will lie in the same feature space and modality as the input? Well, the um, the thing is that uh, at the end, so the transformer will have as many vectors as it has gotten as input. But while the input vectors are, you know, very modality specific, so the the vectors on the left hand side here are text vectors, and the ones on the right hand side are image vectors. Well, after so many, much communication through the cotension modules, uh, the um, representations will be a little mixed. And I, I mean, my personal opinion is that they're not as mixed as, as they should be because uh, the tasks are not enforcing that correctly and so on. But um, yeah, the thing is that that's the goal to, in the end, have something that is cross-modal so that uh, you have a mountain representation that is now both knowing about, you know, the language uh, representation of mountain and the image one uh, and how everything is in that context. Yeah, but uh, it's not hard to do mask language modeling because you know just the word that is masked is then uh, predicted. I hope this answers your question. Uh, another you know uh, thing that one can do during pre-training is to have uh, the model predict what re uh, what is that region that a patch corresponds to or something like that. And it's there are many you know pre-training tasks and uh, but. The one that I think is uh, most important for what I'm going to tell you later is the image sentence alignment score. So these models get a lot of images and their captions. And if uh, it gets an image and a caption, it should say that the image sentence alignment score is high because you no, know, a caption represents the image. So, uh, you know, the content should be quite aligned there. Uh, but uh, sometimes in 50% in of uh, the cases, then the model gets an image and a sentence that is uh, not its caption. It's a caption of a different image. And then the image sentence alignment score should be low. So this is how the model learns to align the left hand side and the right hand side. Because for example, for something like multimodal mass language modeling, it could also get away with just the text, just like, you know, BERT does mass language modeling without image information. Right, and after all this pre-training on millions of, for example, MS Coco uh, images and captions or um, conceptual captions, it you know, should have learned something about images, text, and them together. But then we have to do something with it, right? <laughs> Downstream tasks. And uh, this paper trains uh, fine-tunes uh, such, this Wilbert model, uh, 
vision and language model on the 12 tasks, <laughs> but I will just, for example, highlight here four on this slide and uh, speak about visual question and answering where you have an image and you have a question and the model has to give the answer. And there is also something like visual uh, common sense reasoning where uh, the model also has to give the reason and vision and language uh, transformers are state of the art on this. And they are kind of fighting now which uh, vision and language transformer are state of the art on which task, but they're generally, I mean, there's no <laughs> CNN or LSTM <laughs> to see on the leaderboard nowadays anymore. And if you want to overview of multimodal transformers, then you can look at this paper, uh, because on <laughs> the appendix, it has a table five, where there is uh, quite a nice, um, but now it's a little old, so there's not the new models uh, here, but quite a nice overview of what uh, the models are, what have they been pre-trained on, and uh, so on. And uh, yeah, the, <laughs> uh, the best thing about this is that uh, when I started these, um, you know, models were fairly new, but now with, you know, the, um, the efforts of the authors and the efforts of the Hugging Face community, there's a lot of implementations already in Hugging Face where you can use it really, really simply. And uh, here is just an, ex uh, so I just looked on, on their uh, model list and I extracted here vision and language, um, transformer, three of them, one vision transformer, speech transformers. So uh, now it's easier than <laughs> in any time to do research. And for example, this piece of research that I'm talking uh, about now, about the limits of vision and language models. So when I used LXMERT, for example, I used the Hugging Face library. So uh, really this shout out is just, uh, <laughs> I, I really, um, I, I'm really a fan of this. And um, yeah, this, uh, so the question is, well, what is also the limits of this vision and language models that are state of the art like everywhere? And this piece of work I've conducted with uh, Albert Katt, Annette Frank and Yasser Kalixto, and it's about asking how can, how well can these models count? these vision and language models that I've just presented. And the question might seem a little odd. Why are we interested in counting? Well, counting is a very cross-modal task and I will <laughs> uh, see, uh, we will see why. Because uh, if we want to count in an image, we have to first detect the object instances in that image, because if we don't detect them, we cannot count them. We also have to map different objects to categories because you know we have to figure out that all these persons that we want to count are, are persons and that we're actually counting them, right? And of course, we have to also align these instances then to the references in the textual input because someone has to have asked for them, so <laughs> to, to count for them. And um, and for, for probing how well these models can count, we make use of this image sentence alignment score, which tells us how well an, an image and the sentence align or how, um, how they're not aligned. So um, here we, we set up this foiling task and data set where we have, we take an image and we take um, uh, image a sentence that is actually corresponding to the image because there are four roses in the image, but we have also a foiled sentence where the foil actually differs from the original, from the correct sentence by one word or one phrase, but uh, quite minor, but it has something wrong. Like for example, it says that there are five roses in the image, which is not true. And with the image sentence alignment score, the model should tell us whether, uh, so which of these sentences is actually correct or not. So um, what one can expect is that uh, the image sentence alignment classification threshold is uh, so that, um, the model predicts a correct uh, an alignment where there is actually a correct sentence and it, pre it predicts a misalignment where there is the foil but we also at least assume or expect that the um, image sentence alignment is higher so no threshold there is higher for the correct sentence than for the foil sentence and the corresponding image and we take three models and i won't spend um, more details on that and uh, we, what we learn is that with, the, you know, just after pre-training, uh, these models are actually not able to solve the task, but if we fine tune on the task, then they're really good. I mean, 80%, that's actually a reason, reasonably good number. Uh, and we, 
and the thing is with fine tuning is that um, sometimes it you know during fine tuning the model because it has the capacity picks up a lot of spurious correlations or things that I mean, the question is always whether does it solve the this data or does it really understand and solve the task? And therefore, we have actually another more reliable test, which is the interpolation test. It's not even extrapolation, so that would be even harder. But we just take the even numbers and um, fine tune on them and test on odd numbers. And when we do this, the uh, you know, accuracy is 50% or around 50%, that's random chance. And this pairwise accuracy that tells us just that the um, alignment score between the correct um, sentence is higher than for the fault sentence, that's even in the wrong direction. So <laughs> it's, not, it's even worse. So, what we, so if we train on even numbers and test on odd numbers, the model doesn't get it. So even though it has seen these uh, odd numerals during pre-training, after we fine-tuned it on, on even numbers, I mean, the, it doesn't get it that it's actually counting and we see very low uh, results. So um, yeah, the conclusions are that, uh, you know, even though during after pre-training, this image sentence alignment works well on MS Coco and conceptual captions, the counting task tells, well, there is a problem in real, really understanding and that these generic representations are perhaps not so generic or there is a lot of catastrophic forgetting uh, happening. But then the question is, why do we even pre-train if we want to forget it during fine tuning? So uh, we advocate for more effective pre-training for testing for catastrophic forgetting and um, we also don't see many of these tests that are testing really uh, particular capabilities of the models and not so much, you know, why we solved this data set in BQA and that's it. Because it's a little of a bummer to see that, well, we want to be on this uh, stage three for solving perception, for going towards NLU, but then we see that the models do not even get the tasks of, uh, I'm referring here to the interpolation test. So yeah, uh, that was my conclusion here. And I would be happy to discuss with you if you perhaps have seen a similar behavior with other modalities, or perhaps if you have seen successes with it. And um, I would thank you. I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to seeing your questions. Thank you very much, Leticia. That was great. It's good to have like a sober view uh, on, on this really hyped up architecture and see what, what the currently at least the limit is. So great. Uh, any questions? Okay, so we have one from some student. Uh, my question is unrelated, but which tool that it used to prepare this slide deck? <laughs> That's the question. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you won't believe it, but it's PowerPoint. I learned that tools used right can actually achieve a lot of good results. Yeah, I'm, I'm using PowerPoint even for my videos, if you know them. I know it's, uh, you know, it sounds uh, a little, little, <laughs> but it's actually working really great. PowerPoint. Okay. Other questions? Uh, if I have one uh, which is a bit general, you touched on that, but it's not easy to um, grasp it in detail, I guess. But what do you think goes wrong, so to speak, in this uh, more hard tests? Like, why why is it so much off? Because it's really like chance. It's not that it's doing okay-ish. It's like yeah. really not not getting anything. So have you? Because this is also kind of going in the direction of explainable AI. So have you unpacked a bit what types of uh, representations are formed and what really goes on and what needs to be added potentially? Yeah, so <laughs> I have perhaps a very pessimistic view on this, but um, it, it's really what I said in the uh, last sentences that it's a bummer that the model doesn't understand like anything. So it doesn't even get the task. And um, so all these representations that are formed are, very good for, you know, so if if it has been trained on data that uh, enforces the model to 
align, for example, objects with the mentions of objects in on the textual side. It will do that. So you will see, for example, the attention maps focusing very much on objects. So uh, the attention going from you know the object mentioned to the to the object in the image. That that will happen. But um, you know, it's like. Um, I, I call these models uh, huge statistical correlation detector machines, uh, very complicated ones, and they work very, very, very well. So I, I won't want, I don't want to diminish the what they can achieve. But the thing is, we can build with them very much. We can build products, but I don't think we can build linguistic insight or much insight with them. Um, and uh, I, I have. But it's, it's not, you know, um, I don't think that these uh, two anecdotes are a publishable thing, but I've seen these kind of transformers or models just not getting the task. So just to explain to you, perhaps, you know, the natural language inference inference task where you have two sentences so this is language only and uh, you have two sentences like for example it's raining outside and then um i know they're outside it's wet right and these two sentences are in an entailment relationship because i'm you know they, they kind of um uh, so uh, yeah and um the model, uh, so there are models, transformer models that are trained on NLI, so to predict contradiction, neutrality, or entailment between two sentences. But, and they work really well. They're state of the art, I know 80, 90% on benchmarks. But then you ask such a model, and I, I know it with Albert, so the Albert based um, NLI model, but you ask it, um, what is the relationship between a sentence and the same sentence? So you have, it's raining outside and it's raining outside. What would any human say? It's entailment, right? Well, do you know what the model says? It's contradiction Be because it doesn't get it. So it's, it's okay. like, it's totally outside of its distribution of its, what it has seen during training. So during training, it has seen a lot of that sentence and that sentence a little differently. It has seen a lot of unrelated sentences for the contra contradiction class, but it has never seen the same sentence and the same sentence again, and it doesn't mm -hmm. actually understand entailment. And it's the same thing, but on a uh, bigger level with, with what's happening here. So mm -hmm. um, in, in a sense, uh, there these models are detecting the correlations and the everything that is uh, you know fulfilling their loss and <laughs> making their loss at the end of the day low but they're not getting it and uh, what we can do of course and uh, you know more data helps every time and this is what we see because with more data you get more of these examples you get more coverage and um, there's a lot of talk about out of distribution um, uh, and generalization and so on. But what I actually see is just that you increase the training data so much that everything you test it on, it's not actually that out of distribution, it's more or less very mm -hmm. much in distribution. But uh, so if your whole world is seen during training, then of course you won't be surprised during testing, right? Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, because I, I, so with the current paradigm, I don't really believe in out of distribution. Of course, there are some tricks like we you can shift the um, distribution and then it just happens to, to work and so on, but it's not like working uh, and it's not really understanding anything. <laughs> yeah. I see. So that ties back um, to what is a prominent also kind of discussion in this uh, artificial uh, reasoning corpus from so the Soleil Challenge, where you have like simple tasks like counting that supposedly is, and there is a good body of knowledge from a behavioral point of view like uh, counting is an innate cognitive capacity that humans have, but all the state-of-the-art models fail spectacularly. So it goes, it confirms this unfortunate event, even like uh, state-of-the-art transformers. Okay. Well, good to know Maybe what you though. So it is what it is. <laughs> Maybe I can add something to that because uh, in the last NLP made up, we had uh, Jacqueline Den Hollander talking about how the brain works in uh, comparison to uh, yeah, modern transformer-based models, or uh, she, she explicitly compared it to BERT um, work, and that there are differences. And, and she was exactly pointing at, at those kind of differences that, I mean, 
Uh, transformer models are basically statistical models. So as you say, they learn like uh, covariances and, and correlations and things like that, but that's not how a brain does really understanding a concept. And there's still a lot to do that we can really model that kind of work that our fabulous brain does, right? <laughs> so probably <clears throat> we need to get away uh, from only statistical models. I don't know how that's possible, but probably there will be a way in the very short term future. I mean, there's a lot going on, right? I mean, attention is, is, is already losing traction in some parts of, of science, right? Um, yeah, in some parts, but in other parts, it's only starting, I think. <laughs> that's uh, So I think we will still ride this uh, wave for, for some time, because as I said, we can build beautiful products with this. But the problem is we cannot build any insight so far. And um, I also think that so it, where if I would have like a pot of a lot of money, <laughs> I would invest it in brain research because uh, our brain is somehow initialized with a lot of things. And, you know, I, I if you ask me whether if we would take these transformers and uh, just scale it up with tons of more data than we have right now. So like imagine infinite amount of data and imagine an infinitely big transformers. Uh, if you tell me that if with these sizes uh, you can really achieve understanding and um, so, or at least uh, a model that is indiscernible uh, from a human, I mean, it might be possible. I don't know. I wouldn't tell no. I wouldn't tell, yet, tell yes, because we don't even know how this thing <laughs> works. So uh, therefore, I would really love to, um, to get a, a lot, like a breakthrough in neuroscience and um, if we could, you know, bet more on on the initialization we get when we are born with it, um, yeah. That, but of course, this is almost science fiction. But <laughs> um, we have another question. Yeah. yeah, please. I was about to. Okay, so it's yeah. from Marco P. Uh, are there specific metrics to quantify how such a model gets it instead of managing to fulfill its task? Well, <laughs> uh, metrics, that's, that's a very, it, it's a good point because uh, I mean, what we're looking at is accuracy on a task. And when I say task, I actually mean data set because we are almost never, I mean, when are we ever testing tasks? We are testing data sets. And, um, uh, you know, there, apart from accuracy, there are also some ways to look into how the representations change with the layer, how um, there are also interesting, and I think uh, these are almost the most insightful uh, analysis now in multimodality, is ablation studies. Like, for example, uh, so, you know, the model claims it looks or you know the authors of the model claims it look that um, that the model looks at both images and text and it, it gets you know gets the answer from from both modalities because you know you need to look at the image to answer a, a question about the image and uh, what interesting ablation studies do is that they for example replace the image with zeros or you know uh, corrupt the image a lot so that you uh, the model cannot rely on the image anymore or replace it with a random image. And what we see is that instead of hurting the model by much, by, you know, taking half of its input, yeah, right, it's, it's okay <laughs> because VQA, uh, visual question and answering, has a lot of biases in just the language modality. So, um, for example, a regularity is that almost every or too many too many of the questions, which are how many cats or something are in the image, have the answer two or three, but not 10 and not one and uh, not zero uh, often. So uh, just by, you know, saying two or one all the time, you uh, two, or, two or three all the time, you get already 50% of the things right. So, and you don't even need to look at the image because how to, how many, it's, or, it's already, you know, uh, an answer bet uh, between two and three. And um, yeah, so what, how we uh, see that people quantify this is uh, by these ablation studies where they remove something that should be crucial for the model to really get the answer because otherwise a human couldn't get the answer. 
And what we see is that the model gets the answer anyway because of these statistical biases and uh, which are just in one modality. So it gets to answers which should have never known, uh, but because of the biases and uh, these regularities. Yeah. Thanks for the questions. <laughs> Do we have any more questions maybe? Uh, yeah, I, this is Ankush, I would like to ask. Um, uh, thanks for the talk, Hi. generally. Uh, I wanted to ask, like you mentioned, catastrophic forgetting could be one of the reasons that for the failure of this model. I wonder if you can freeze the, you know, pre-trained layers and then have a deeper layer, have deeper layers during the fine tuning. Can that exclude the reason? Uh, like, can that exclude uh, catastrophic, for, uh, catastrophic forgetting to be the reason? It can to some extent, but uh, uh, also not to like, I mean, and we did that and uh, it's, um, and the results were still bad. So um, the thing is catastrophic forgetting is there, but it's not the only uh, issue. Yeah. Uh, and um, so the thing, I, I we also have some unpublished work I am not allowed to talk about, but yet <laughs> perhaps you will see a next video about it. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, so catastrophic forgetting is not explaining everything of it because we have these experiments where we freeze all the weights apart from this last head that makes then the classification um, decision. Yeah, mm -hmm. but also uh, it, it is a problem <laughs> too. Okay. But you can't com Thanks. you can't even even by freezing you can't completely exclude it for some reason. No, uh, you can't uh, co con, um, completely exclude it because I mean we we look at this image uh, sentence alignment head and that it on itself can have some so uh, the that head that um, so if you train the uh, take the pre-trained weights and you take that head after pre-training, it will have some things that you will lose if you just retrain that decision head. So even if it's a little linear classifier, it could do some things, but, okay. but that effect is then minor, yeah. Okay, thank you. More questions maybe? Okay, then. Let's thank again Letizia for this great stimulating talk. And now there is some time for just hanging out and networking.